So last week we began to talk about relationships, dating, and marriage. And this topic is always interesting first because you guys aren't too far off from, from what I've heard someone call epiphany day. You know, an epiphany, which means that you have this moment of realization. Uh, for you dudes, uh, you said, man, girls might not actually have cooties. There was this first time that you saw Hannah, you know, the girl that you've known for years and you thought, why, or you asked, why do I suddenly feel drawn to her? And the older you got, you began to realize this was something called a crush. And maybe you began to change your normal route in the hallway at school to accidentally bump into her. And what was next? Planning how you might ask her out. And who knows, maybe the wedding will come eventually. Uh, but really, it's obvious that you do or will at some point, you will feel this desire to have a romantic relationship, right? Whoever you're dating or want to date, it always starts by simply being attracted to that boy or girl. When we find someone attractive today, this basically, this is what we mean, that we find them physically appealing. So our initial attraction to someone primarily comes from the way that he or she looks. Listen, this ought to go without saying, but I don't think it, it uh, people say it a lot, so I'll go ahead and say it. There is nothing wrong with this reality of being physically attracted to someone. It's natural, right? We see this all over the scriptures in Genesis, Adam's first glimpse of seeing Eve. Another guy, uh, also in the book of Genesis, Jacob, who sees this girl named Rachel and he's smitten by her. God has embedded in us an appreciation for beauty. He's given us things that we find attractive. And this is something that then launches us to want so, to want a romantic relationship with someone. Listen, this is a very strange and ambiguous force because it really honestly makes us do some crazy things. Maybe things that you normally wouldn't do all to impress that boy or girl. So when I was trying to convince my now wife that I really liked her, I actually got on a plane for the first time in my life at 24 years old to go visit her in North Carolina where she was living. Listen, it was scary to navigate an airport by myself for the first time. I even had this moment when I was boarding the plane and I asked myself, what in the world am I doing? Attraction is a powerful force in students. Culture presents to us a story or a narrative on how to go about chasing romance. One of those huge things that it rides into a worldview is what sex is. It defines it. Yeah, I said that word. You're not supposed to say that word at church. But the reason why I want to and feel like we need to discuss this is because the Bible tells us that sex is a gift from God. Right? It's not something that's taboo or that you shouldn't talk about. He's embedded in us a desire for it because he designed it. He designed it to be good. But what are the things that culture tells us about sex? Let's get real for a moment, right? It says, you feel a desire for pleasure? Man, just seek it out to the max and don't stop. Or sex is the epitome and the end goal of any relationship. Or what about have sex with as many people as frequently as you can? Or even the longer you wait for it, the weirder you are. Listen, I'm not naive to the messages in some parts of our culture. And I'm also not saying that sex, as culture portrays it, might not be enjoyable, or that some of you have already crossed those lines. What I am saying is that I believe with every ounce of my soul that God offers us a better story, right? A way that is ultimately enjoyable, including for those of you who have crossed those boundaries. So let's actually turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 where we see the first marriage that God himself officiates. Like how awesome, right? There's no headaches of planning the wedding and God officiates it. That sounds like the ideal wedding. That's a joke. But we see in chapter two, what we see is that God is creating the universe. He creates water, land, plants, and animals, animals, and he calls everything good after it's created. And then he gets to Adam, which is the epitome of his creation. And he looks at Adam and says some interesting words. He says, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now this is before sin, where God created a world of harmony in a design, and he designed it perfectly. So this tells us two crucial things. First, God was moving to meet the problem of Adam's loneliness, right? Even in paradise, Adam was lonely. There was something that was lacking. In all of creation, only one thing was not good. It was not for him to be alone. Second, that Eve was the answer to that problem. When God says that he will create a helper, many people might think that it's someone who maybe sweeps the floor, makes the beds, prepares meals, but that's not what this word actually means. In the Old Testament, right, this word helper actually was a word that was actually used 
of God himself to describe God. A helper meant one who supplies what is lacking in another person. So God created Eve to do what Adam couldn't do alone. Right? He put them together for a purpose. And what was that? And the first thing we see here in Genesis is that uh, God's intention for humanity, a chapter back, actually in chapter one, he looks at them and he says, be fruitful and multiply. He intended both man and woman who were made in his image to work together in harmony and caring for all creation. So God institutes his mar this marriage at its basic level to be how God will multiply his image. We would live that out, glorifying him, right? A good and powerful God by taking care of the world. So we see actually a second purpose for marriage and sex here in the next few verses. Check this out. It says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and he shall hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So the two, like we discussed, would come together, become one flesh, and would know each other to the deepest level that you can know someone. And they did. And we see that they didn't feel any shame in their nakedness, right? Nakedness here actually is both literal and symbolic. It describes a relationship where there is nothing to be hidden because there is nothing to hide. In our world, we can't walk around naked, right? Both literally and not literally. Nakedness here, it speaks about being deeply and truly known, both physically, spiritually, and actually a third way, emotionally. Students, we like to be noticed, especially some of you, but we hate for people to stare at us, right? It makes us uncomfortable as if a stranger or someone is trying to peer into our soul, into the deepest parts of our life. In other words, we have this tension inside of us to be fully known, but like we see later in chapter three in the story in Genesis, we hide, right? Adam and Eve, when they chose to take themselves out from under God's rule and care, it fractured their relationship with God and also with themselves, right? You see this tension between each of them and they run and they hide. But that wasn't the intention of marriage, right? Sex is one sort of intimacy where you share yourself at the deepest level, nothing to hide. You are known. God has wired us and he has wired that longing in us. But that original design that God had given us has been twisted and, and minimized, not only in culture's definition of sex, but also in our personal sin. Listen, minimizing sex is just a way that we keep ourselves from truly being known by one person. So we hold sex as just something you do when you're bored, there's no commitment. And we also feel a sense of not being satisfied. So this is why culture in some ways has perverted and it has actually brought sex above its role in marriage, right? Listen, we live in a sex crazed culture because of that unsatisfied feeling or that longing. Being fully known the way that God intended, that was what was meant to satisfy. So we avoid being known, right? We buy into this other narrative because sex doesn't fill that longing in us, right? So the pleasure is fleeting. So we chase after it again and again, not knowing that part of the reason that we do that might be because we don't live the way that we were designed. So the ways that we chase after sex that is outside of God's design is just one way that the rebellion, brokenness, and actually the reality that sin has severed us from God, that's how it plays out in our life. And this is where Jesus not only redeems us, but he actually deepens the meaning of marriage more than, than what we see here. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter five. In Ephesians chapter five, way, way down the road from Genesis, we see a picture of what marriage looks like for a follower of Jesus. Paul, who wrote this letter, begins by talking about how a wife and a husband should relate to one another. And everything he says reflects the way that Jesus loves those that he has saved and vice versa. You see, the Bible shines a light on our lives as people who have reasons not to want to be known. Right? We're broken, and you have felt that brokenness. It stems from sin and its effect, not only on our life, but also in creation. Right? God's good design for joy and life have been twisted. The perfect world that God created in Genesis is fractured. So things don't work the way that they should. Sure, we might see glimpses of God's beauty that he intended everywhere, but still it's broken. But Jesus steps into that broken world. And on top of that, he steps into the darkest spaces of our lives and he pulls us out from it. He ultimately mends that relationship we broke with God and begins to restore our lives and the world. Marriage is a picture of this and Ephesians 5 tells us that. 
everything about marriage and sex is one part of that. And this, students, deepens the meaning of romance, marriage, and sex. Right? It puts it in its original design and boundaries that were meant for our joy. God isn't against our joy. He's for it, which is why he designed everything in creation, including marriage and sex, to reflect him. It points us to himself, our greatest good. Right? Marriage is good because he created that relationship and gave it purpose. One of those being sex. So when we understand that, in this correct view, when we have a correct view of marriage and sex, Sex doesn't bear the burden of fulfilling us by becoming the ultimate end of a romantic relationship. It's a way that we live into God's desire to multiply and have families that reflect Him. And it's a way that we imperfectly strive to be ultimately known and love the same way that He knows and He loves us. So we commit ourselves to another person for life as a way to regain that original design that God intended for Adam and Eve. So, here's a question. Can you have pleasurable sex outside of God's design in marriage? Sure, but it won't be to the depth that God intended it to have. You won't feel that depth. It certainly doesn't draw us to God who ultimately satisfies us. But students, he offers you a better story, which is to have sex inside the boundaries of marriage that glorifies him. So if you're in the room tonight and you've crossed those lines, look at me. Jesus came for people like you. Like all of us, Jesus wants you and he wants me. He wants our messiness and our failures. And he offers you this better story. He offers you himself. He can redeem the darkest parts of our lives. The, one, you know, the, the ones that make us feel wobbly because we've walked outside of his good design. If you believe that, you believe the gospel. The good news that Jesus pays for our sins to redeem us and bring us back to the Father. For all of us, let me end by saying this. Sex is good, but it's not built for eternity. Neither is marriage. Marriage and sex are good because God designed it, but Jesus is better. Right? He is better than anything in life. He is better than life itself. So as we discuss in small groups tonight, let's consider that and the many ways that we've sold ourselves short by embracing a story that will never satisfy. Right? Although in that moment it might be good, it never delivers what it promises. But God's story, that will always deliver and satisfy. Let me pray. God, we're thankful for the good design that you've given us. And Lord, we in our sin have walked outside of those, but Lord, I'm also thankful for Jesus that redeems us when we've walked outside of your design. Lord, help us to see your better story and to embrace it as we walk, as we discuss in groups tonight. Pray this in your holy name. Amen.